Today on Cutting Edge, we look at the long-term effect of hunger on violence, education and inequality in South Africa. We will see why a hungry nation is also a violent one. I did not mind even to take a full bottle of beer and throw it to my wife. Not having enough food uh, creates a pathway for men enacting violence. When you are hungry, you feel very weak, your stomach is empty, it's drowning. We are facing a real crisis of malnutrition in our country. This is Vuani, in the Vemba district of northern Limpopo. Only 25% of residents here are employed, meaning hunger is a daily battle. Naledzani, a single mother of two, is one of the 14 million South Africans going to bed hungry every night. Sick with TB and unable to find employment, she feeds three mouths with 700 rands worth of social grant money each month. Often, Naledzani will wait for her daughters to return from school before she eats anything at all. <laughs> Taking TB medication on an empty stomach leaves Naledzani feeling nauseous and weak. For her daughters, it impacts their ability to concentrate at school. Already ranked as one of the most unequal societies in the world, South Africa's food crisis is entrenching future physical and social divides between the haves and the have-nots of our society. Activists are calling this the food apartheid. In a country that is so rich, where, you know, how do we explain 14 million people going to bed hungry, one in three people being jobless, you know, one in three living or surviving on a social grant? Those aspects of apartheid have still not been dealt with. In this battle to feed families, Research has shown that it is typically mothers who carry the social burden of feeding their children, resulting in high levels of stress and anxiety. For Naledzani, this rings true. In Mandela squatter camp in Soweto, single mother Mapumulo shares the stress of having to feed her 16-year-old twins too. My mother is a 
how so we met you, Catalazi, or so na little Bahali, Bosa, Bosa, Stephen Motokai. Go, I get the Libato, how about Sheba Babona, Sabonaka Babona Silan, her Solomon. They receive two meals a day from the African Children's Feeding Scheme, a 70 year old feeding program that feeds over 14,500 children daily. Her 16-year-old twins know the physical intensity of hunger well. When you are hungry and you feel very weak, your stomach is empty, it's groaning, you just feel like, is this panda inside your stomach? And it, the lightning is like, you know that sound, makes that sound that you are hungry now. You feel really weak. You feel like sleeping or lying down. Then again, emotionally, you just feel like, I, this is not life. I can't stay like this. I can't live like this. I have to do something about this. After receiving groceries and meals after school through the feeding scheme, Mapumulo saw a drastic difference in her children's lives. The twins noticed the biggest difference in the classroom. Before we came to the feeding scheme, we usually went to bed without any food, went to school without any food, so we wouldn't be able to concentrate properly in class and then we would always get into trouble by fighting other learners because of we would be hungry. But then when we came to African Children Feeding Scheme, we got food, we were able to go to bed with food, we were able to go to school after eating, which make a lot of difference because of we were able to play with other kids, we were able to concentrate in class. Naletzani and Mapumolo are fighting for better lives for their children. But studies report that other mothers are less lucky. They have to sell sex for food when left with no alternatives. We are publicly humiliating the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society because they've ended up in a situation which is really no fault of their own. I think it's very, very difficult if you are a parent to have children that you, that you cannot feed. And as I said, most of this burden falls on women. And in many communities, it's become so common for women to trade sex for food or for money for, to buy food for their children that it is now, it's considered normal. For Naletzani and Mapumulo, the cost of food impacts their children's future health and employment. Despite this, they are fighting for change. But true gender equality cannot take place without food equality too. How can we talk about gender equality in, in that kind of situation? How can we talk about, you know, women participating fully in social life when hundreds and thousands of women are subjected to that and to the stress every single day of trying to work out how to feed their children? This is Deep Sluit, one of the most violent communities in South Africa. Shepard Lamini is a resident here and is not proud of his past. I don't mind even to drink from yesterday up to now. I'll be sitting here drinking, not remembering that the kids, they need food, they need clothing, they need money, all that stuff. As long as I'm satisfying my needs, I'm fine. Then from there, I'll go out and violent the other people. You know, to violate some uh, a person who's defenseless, really, is quite, quite embarrassing. 
Fights with his wife were a regular occurrence. I did not mind even to take a full box of beer and throw it to my wife. Imagine if I hit you the head with that box. You know, something dangerous, something that can happen. Maybe I may hit him and then he dies there because I don't know what I'm doing. Poverty emasculates men, says Mzoike, a lead researcher from Swanke Gender Justice Project. He interviewed 2,500 men in Deep Sluit for a recent study on gender-based violence. Their study found having food reduced the odds of violence by men by 40%. Men feeling that their masculinity um, is, is basically reduced to nothing uh, because then they are not able to meet the immediate expectations of providing for themselves but also for their families. Um, and, 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 and it's also a, a pathway to basically drinking. Men do a lot of beer binging in a way of trying to move away uh, from thinking about the fact that they can meet uh, these expectations of providing. Because as a man, I have to be a provider as the head of the, uh, my family. So I have to be a provider and do everything that they need. And I'm, sometimes I feel, you know, undermined by the other people if I can see that the other person maybe is working is providing his children with all the necessi necessities, then, but if I'm just coming here with an empty handed or they are going to school with the empty stomach, you know, that thing, it gives me more pressure. It's a desperation that often leads to crime. Men who, who participated in the study um, have, in a way, responded that they have stolen food, they have stolen uh, money, they've stolen clothes in the last 12 months. And this was not because they wanted to go and buy alcohol, but this was because they wanted to buy food. Um, and, 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 and I think for me, going to that extent of not asking for help, it then shows just how much shame is, is put into not being able to have food. This also fuels domestic tension. If you find out that maybe you are my wife, then I've taken you out the eye after when I was drunk. And the following day in the morning when I wake up here, you are in hospital. I'll start to ask the people here, what happened? Why she's in hospital? I said, ah, you beat her yesterday. I do that. They said, yes. You know what? That thing will remain with you. My wife was not like that. Was a good woman like the rest of the women, but now she has got one eye just because of me. So where am I going to end with this? Anecdotally, we are finding evidence in the research that shows that uh, uh, not having enough food uh, creates a pathway for men enacting violence. Tracy Ledger, a food security expert, believes hunger is one of the major triggers for violence in South African society. Early childhood malnutrition, severe early childhood malnutrition, permanently damages the brain's impulse control. And that makes you much more predisposed to becoming a permanently violent adult. The other way in which children become violent is if they grow up in violent households, if they are constantly exposed to violence. The cost of food means South Africans are forced to buy cheaper, less healthy food. Alongside high levels of starvation, South Africa is now the most obese nation in sub-Saharan Africa. Now that I'm just weighing 120, they told me that I must lose at least than that 20 because I was weighing 115, 150, so I lost so much weight for the past six months. So since then, I have to lose another 20, at least maybe be 100. Like Inkosi, a 24-year-old mother of three living in Alexandra Township, is eight months pregnant. She is also unemployed and clinically obese, weighing 120 kilograms. Doctors have warned that her health is dangerously at risk, but she is unable to afford healthier food alternatives. Well, you told me that I'm going to have a heart disease and it's going to be a little bit difficult for me in labor, during labor. So I may actually lose my life. So, so since then, I became free, so I even told my mother about that. So I thought we became stressful about it. South Africans' poor access to healthy foods threatens equality across the country. I think the first thing is to stop rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and kind of like step back and go, well, you know, 
what we're doing up until now isn't helping. Nobody stands to benefit in a country where our public health burden is going to collapse because of the effects of malnutrition, where our education system, despite all the money that we could throw at it, is not going to be able to educate a significant number of children because they just cannot learn in school. And where we are, our society is not going to get less violent, it's going to get more and more violent because more and more people are going hungry every year. When you live in a community where it's poverty stricken, the priority will be to fill your stomach up. As long as it's not poisonous, then that's okay. Um, so healthy eating, I think it's in the list of people's worries about, um, uh, people worry about where do they get food and get food immediately, not what type of food it is. I think the term food apartheid is very, very apt for a couple of reasons. The first thing is that it has long been normal in South Africa for poor black people to go hungry. This is not something that's, that's been invented in the last 20 years. Poor black people have gone hungry in this country for the last 100 years. Hunger and obesity are both symptoms of the cost and accessibility of food in South Africa. Dr. Tim DeMaia has seen the increasing rise of diseases like diabetes and cancer among new mothers and their children. The long-term impact of these health issues, he says, are severe and far-reaching. There's a lot of research that, um, recently that has uh, shown that malnutrition in the first two years of life has got an impact on later um, diseases in adulthood. The presence of obesity, the presence of hypertension, the presence of diabetes, and even things such as cognitive capacity and, and capacity to be a productive member of society. This cycle may continue for Lucky's unborn baby, who will be predisposed to developing early onset diabetes, high blood pressure, and even childhood obesity. I don't want to lose my babies. I don't want them to lose their mother, since they're all I have. So I don't want them to lose me, actually, so I can see their future in the next present. The first thousand days from conception to two years is, you know, the window of opportunity. And the only period in which we can address the, both the physical and mental development of a child. We miss that gap. And no matter what we do beyond that, that child is permanently damaged. In South Africa, nine and ten year olds are among the highest consumers of sugary drinks in the world, beaten only by children in the USA, according to research. That's the first thing I tell parents when they um, have a problem with a child who's overweight, is to cut out sugary drinks. Because you don't realise how many calories you're taking in. But equally, there's a large amount of sugar in what we consider to be healthy drinks, like fruit juice. Um, and, and parents are not aware of this. And cutting those out and replacing it with water there's a huge amount for, our, uh, for limiting our um, excessive sugar intake. And um, I'm a big proponent of uh, sugar tax. I always do cough rings, so oh, wow. They told me to limit too much acid. So I, since then, I only do juice, yeah, or homemade juice. We live to share people, that's <laughs> Dietitians have advised Lucky to urgently eat healthier foods, but she cannot afford to do so. They're too expensive, so I cannot afford. So he told me that I must at least eat twice foods. So since I'm expecting, I told him, what can I supposed to do? So what am I supposed to do? So since then, I left him with the question mark, so I don't know. Just like Lucky, Mapumulo hopes for a different future for her children. Kilakata <laughs> Bo pelo ba ba pelang wana ji ba 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 ilo shwa kabone.
So I think what apartheid did was very effectively make the suffering of millions of people not just acceptable, but essentially invisible. And from where I'm sitting, not much seems to have changed. For Kia Betswe, a young South African who has lived through hunger, he is hopeful that a united South Africa can tackle the food apartheid that threatens to further divide an already divided society. As Mother Teresa said, if you cannot feed 100, just feed one. Do your best. Play your part. Let us not say they are not my problem. Your fa no. There is a famous saying that says, if it takes a village to raise a child. As Africans, we must all unite to fight hunger. Since his days of violence and drinking, Shepherd has turned his life around. He now works with the Community Policing Forum and is seen as a community leader fighting for peace, a protector of the weak. I like the children, but mine are not here just because of their father who was violent. But they like me. They also know that he stopped drinking. They know that he stopped drinking now. He's a real father. He's a responsible father. Every month I must make sure that the scent that I get, I must share with the kids. I must drive my own. But for the kids, make sure they are covered. Not to entertain anyone before my children. My children comes first, and then the second is my wife. I'm the last of children. For many others in deep sloot and poor communities, hunger remains a daily battle. People who vote communities are at the bottom, bottom, bottom of the food chain. And that really does create frustration. That really does create tension. That is why when uh, somebody steals, even if they steal just a loaf of bread, and that communities react to that in the most extreme and aggressive violence that sometimes become mob justice, people are necklaced and banned because uh, people have been failed, failed by their own democratic government and that we shouldn't be even talking that there are families who live below four rand, 10 rand a day. It just doesn't make sense. It, does, it doesn't augur well with the, with the constitution of this country that's supposed to promote human rights and human dignity. The hunger right now seems to be dominating. Yes, it won the battle, but it hasn't won the war. It is up to us to contribute, to help them, to give them something, to give them hope. We must give them hope to give them a reason to live for. Amen. <laughs>